Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. October marks Texas Archaeology Month, a celebration of the state's history and heritage through the lens of archaeology. The Alamo plays a pivotal role as an active archaeological site where history is still being uncovered. For example, archaeology helps shape our understanding of how the Alamo Church and Lawn Barrack were built and the people who lived and worked here over hundreds of years. Today, we reveal exactly what archaeology has taught us about the Alamo, the new work underway right now, and how you can get involved during Texas Archaeology Month. I'm your host, Emily Balkum. We're joined by Dr. Tiffany Lindley, the Alamo's archaeologist. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Archaeology is defined as the scientific study of the human past using material remains. What does that mean to you in the context of the Alamo? So archaeology at the Alamo is really unique in that we have a, a pretty good idea about the events that transpired here. There are several historical documents um, that describe the use of the site from the mission period all the way through the modern era. What archaeology contributes to the Alamo story is tangible evidence of those events that are described in mission inventories, accounts of the battle, and newspaper articles. Through an archaeological analysis, we also add to our knowledge of specific periods of times or events. How did you become an archaeologist, and what was your path to the Alamo? Well, I have two versions of the story, the short and the long. We'll take both. <laughs> so the short version is um, I took a class in college. It was the very first class I took as a freshman, and I loved it. It was called Great Discoveries in Archaeology. And I was thinking the class would be about um, ancient Egypt and Greece and Rome, kind of what we always think about. But it was so much more. And uh, it was showing not just this old world archaeology, which is, you know, old world being, um, you know, Egypt and Greece and Rome, but also all of the great archaeology that occurs here in the U.S. And I just fell in love with it and decided, wow, I'd like to be an archaeologist. How do I do that? And I um, became an anthropology major in college, which is what archaeology falls under, and got an advisor who was an archaeologist, and now here I am. Here you are at the Alamo. So what was your professional path out of school to the Alamo? So I went from my undergraduate straight into grad school. I didn't take any time off. Um, so as I was getting my master's degree and then my PhD, I was working in archaeology through um, research, so through the university. And it got to a point where I wanted to explore my path beyond academic archaeology into something that's called cultural resource management. So that's the type of archaeology that most archaeologists do, um, and that's what we're doing here at the Alamos, is, uh, often called CRM, shortened. I had a lot of friends who were, in, who were in CRM and asked, hey, do you know of any projects that are local, meaning local to San Antonio? And a friend said, oh, yeah, I think they're going to start work at the Alamo. Would you be interested in that? Would you be interested? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I said, um, yes, please. How do I do that? That's a no-brainer. Exactly. So I, um, I joined a, a team, um, it was a, a very large team of about, I think, 18, 20 people. And this was in 2019. And um, excavation started at the Long Barrack and in the church, all of that in support of um, conservation work that had been really... Um, I guess jump started by Pam Rosser, our conservator, and we knew that we wanted to look at the foundations of these historic structures to see how we can better preserve them for the future so they last another 300 years and beyond. Uh, so in order to do, to look at those walls, we needed to get to the foundations. So we had to dig. And in the state of Texas, if you're going to dig, you got to have an archaeologist. So I joined that team of archaeologists. That project was initially meant to only be 40 days, and it lasted over two years or close to two years. <laughs> and um, then after that project was done in 2021, um, an opening came up for the Alamo archaeologist. And I said, well, I have this experience. I've been working here for two years already. Um, let's just keep doing it because I loved it. And here I am today. And we're so grateful. It's easy to say the battle only lasted 90 minutes. What more is there to learn? But people have lived on this land for thousands of years. There is always more to learn. That is what is so great about archaeology. 
For example, we might have a document that references a defensive trench, and it's great to say, oh, this document says the, def the defenders dug a trench inside the compound. What's even better is through archaeology, finding that trench and saying not only can the historians say, we know this, the archaeologists can say, not only do we know it, we can see it. And that is that's pretty amazing. We're still finding um, artifacts as well in addition to um, a feature. So a, a trench is called a feature, meaning it's uh, you cannot be moved. Um, but an artifact is something that's portable. But we're still finding both, both of those. So there's still evidence of the battle, and there's still evidence of the mission period, which was you know, back in the 1700s. So we still have that material we're, we're finding almost every time we dig. Let's define those terms again, feature versus artifact. Absolutely. So these are two terms that are critical um, in archaeology. You have a feature, which is something that is immovable, man-made um, from the past. So that could be a trench, that could be a hearth, um, a post hole, or a structure, like the, the foundations I was referring to before. Those Something are, that's part of the ground and the land at this right. point. Right. It's not going to be picked up and moved. So an artifact is something that is man-made or uh, something that has been modified by man, and it is portable. So you can pick that up. You can take it with you. Um, that's why we often, especially in Texas, we often find um, artifacts like projectile points everywhere because you can pick them up and they you can move them and also the environment moves them. So, you know, in rivers, you find a lot of projectile points that are flowing down the river and, and moving. A very common question we see on social media is, are you still finding artifacts from the 1836 Battle of the Alamo? Yes, we are. Not in abundance, because there has been a lot of development here on site, but we are still finding um, various artifacts, things like musket balls or gun parts. I think it's important to remember with archaeology, we're never pulling out a complete gun or a complete knife. I get that asked a lot. In fact, um, my family wants, will even ask, did you find a buoy knife? <laughs> and no, we don't find a complete object. That's very rare. With archaeology, we're finding what's left behind. So what I often tell people is think about if you're moving houses, you take all of your good stuff with you, but you might leave some of the broken things behind. And that's what we archaeologists find are the broken pieces that are left behind. So you can kind of think of it as really old trash. But you're putting together the puzzle pieces of history. That's correct. Yeah, you can actually learn a lot from trash. <laughs> good to know. You use a variety of archival records to help show what may be found at the site. A big one is the Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps, and we're going to post a link to them in the podcast notes for everyone to see. But what are these maps, and how do they help you? The Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps are an amazing resource for archaeologists, not just here in San Antonio and not just in Texas, but there are Sanborn Maps for various cities across the country, um, and you can find a lot of them are publicly accessible. The Sanborn Maps are great because they're color-coded based on material. So remember, these are fire insurance maps. They were created by fire insurance agents to determine the degree of hazard associated with a property. So these maps will show us structures that existed um, in the early 1900s or the 1800s, and they'll be color-coded. So for example, if you see a structure that's blue, then it was a limestone structure. And that's important to fire insurance agents because if there's a fire, something that is stone versus wood, is that's a very different degree of hazard. But what's great for archaeologists is we can see what structures were at a project area in the past. And if it's a stone versus a wood structure, then if it's, we'll be able to find remains of stone uh, much more easily than we would wood. So that's why the fire insurance maps are really great because they show us what we are likely to find. Very cool. And you have found some interesting artifacts from the time the area around the Alamo was commercialized. Can you describe some of them? Yes. So what's very exciting, I think, is that we don't often talk about the commercialization 
um, uh, around the Alamo. But the Alamo story and the site was so important to the city of San Antonio and um, really played a part in our economic growth. So we have various businesses around the site of the church and the long barracks. So you have a hotel, you have a boarding house and saloon, a tire garage, a fire station. All of these structures and businesses were built, you know, decades after the battle, um, but often they're still tied to the battle. Like the hotel in the back um, was called the Bowie Hotel. So you have um, all of these businesses that no longer exist, and they existed for, you know, a few decades well, what I have found are the remains of some of the foundations and footings where we have our wonderful new Ralston Family Collection Center. We did um, some investigations before the structure was built, and I found a brick foundation of the old complex that was there. So that was the old Bowie Hotel. There was an automobile sales and service. There was a bowling alley, and it has this uh, brick foundation that... There's, it was still there whenever we were um, excavating for the footprint of our new collection center. So it's really exciting to be able to find those old foundations, those old features, and then match them up to the Sanborn maps. And I was able to match up that brick foundation precisely with the uh, southern facade of those structures that were there in 1912. That's so a that, very exciting moment for you. It was very exciting. And uh, to be quite honest, that doesn't happen all too often where all of the pieces come together perfectly like that. So that was extra exciting for me. When you find an artifact, what do you do next? For example, you recently dug trenches near Alamo Plaza and found a very old coin. We spotlighted it on the Alamo social media. Take me through the journey of that coin from the moment you dug it out of the ground. So one of the most important things to remember about archaeology is that artifacts are useless without context. So the first thing we do when we find artifacts is we heavily document the context that we found it in. So that includes what soil is it in, what type of soil, what texture of the soil, are there any inclusions in the soil, and we want to know what's associated with that artifact. So are there other art artifacts near it? Um, are there features nearby? We take all of these uh, notes to document all of that information. We take a ton of photos. We use um, different uh, satellite imagery so we can take like, GPS points. So we, that's the first thing we do. After that, we bag up our artifacts and we put them in breathable bags. Um, you know, especially out here in the Texas heat, we all know how hot it gets. The humidity. Yes, and you don't want condensation to form inside your artifact bag, so you put it in a breathable bag, and it eventually finds its way to the lab. And there it um, is processed, so it's cleaned, and it's, each artifact is cleaned based on its materiality. So for the coin, we used a dry toothbrush, soft toothbrush, and little wooden skewers to get it as clean as possible because you don't want anything to be abrasive and you don't want to damage the artifact. You clean it up and then you catalog it and that's recording even more information. So that's looking at the dimensions. Are there any, um, is there any uh, damage present on the artifact? And then you do analysis. And for the coin, uh, we could see that it said 1882 and there was... Um, some text across the, the top of the coin, and we're looking at it, myself and the other archaeologists, and we're like, well, that's not English, it's not Latin, um, it's not Spanish, so um, did a quick search of the words, and the, the words coupled with, you know, coin in 1882, and got a Google search back. Google <laughs> can be your best friend it, sometimes. It really can, and um, we're, we were able to match it up to an 1882 uh, tin wrapping from Switzerland. People on social media were just fascinated by that. And we should know you do all your work with oversight from the state of Texas. That is correct. So Texas takes very, very good care of their cultural resources. And in the state of Texas, if you're on public, city, or state property, you're going to need a permit from the state of Texas. So all of the work that we do here at the Alamo is permitted work. And I work in collaboration with the state archaeologists and city archaeologists so that uh, we can ensure best methodology. And it's important to remember archaeology, like 
any science. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's a lot of coordination and collaboration. It's not just one person calling the shots. The Alamo just opened a brand new lab for conservation and archaeology. How has that lab changed the game for you? The new lab is fantastic. The best thing the lab gives us is space. We have enough space to process all of our artifacts. We're not jumbled up on one another like we were in our, our old space. Essentially what the lab is doing for us is it allows for more in-depth analysis. And the more analysis you have, the better interpretations you have. The lab was made possible by the Gunn family in memory of courtesy Gunn Jr. We truly thank them for this gift. Tiffany, how has technology changed your work? Because you still use plenty of old school tools like shovels and paintbrushes. <laughs> you are absolutely right. A lot of old school tools. Um, tr a trowel is our best friend. Um, like you said, brushes, little whisk brooms are one of my personal favorites. Um, but we do incorporate a lot of technology. One question I get asked a lot, and I've seen on the social media a lot as well, is do we use ground penetrating radar? And the answer is no, it has been done in the past, but with very mixed results. And the reason for that, ground penetrating radar is a type of technology that sends pulses into the ground. Those pulses will hit um, an obstruction and then bounce back up to a, a reader on the machine. And so you're essentially looking at um, where there might be an anomaly underground. It doesn't give you an x-ray of the ground. It just shows you there might be an anomaly, something that is out of the ordinary here. That technology is fantastic. I've used it in other places. It does not work well in our area for a variety of reasons. One, we're in downtown San Antonio, so there's a lot of underground utilities, and there's a lot of road base and just construction fill. And then the other thing is here in Central Texas, we have a lot of clay. And clay is not a good medium for the GPR to pulse through. GPR works better when you have a very uniform environment. So we don't have an ideal environmental conditions here. And like I said, we've it's been tried in the past three times and the results were all over the place. So it's not a technology that we use here. That's good to know. It's a tool in the toolbox, but it's not the be-all, end-all. Exactly. But some of the technologies that we do use are um, different laser scannings. We have some great imagery we can produce using um, different scanning processes. And we also use GPS and Total Data Station to get absolute locations of where we're digging, if we find any features. So we're still incorporating technology. Um, it just might be some technologies that maybe aren't as flashier as, as publicly known. Now you have some upcoming work scheduled in the Long Barrack. What is the goal of that project? The Long Barrack project is something I'm very excited about. We will be starting in the next few weeks and it's going to be on the exterior of the Long Barrack, not, not inside. The archeologists are excavating in support of the installation of a drainage system. Those of you in San Antonio, you might remember we had a very wet spring. It actually was a good thing for the Alamo because we were able to see that we have a water infiltration problem at the Long Barrack. Water in any structure is bad, but especially bad for a limestone structure like the Long Barrack. So we wanna make sure that we can divert water away from that historic structure. So there's gonna be a subterranean drainage system installed. But again, we're gonna be digging for a subterranean uh, system. So you gotta have the archeologists to make sure that the drainage system won't negatively impact any cultural resources. So we'll be digging excavation units. Um, archeologists dig very systematically. So it takes a very long time, but we're hoping that um, we can find some, um, some interesting artifacts or maybe features that you know, possibly date as far back as the, the founding of the mission, maybe even some more battle-related artifacts. Stay so, tuned. Exactly. We'll be posting weekly once we start up in a few weeks. So um, we'll have updates every single week so everyone can um, follow us on our journey. And as the Alamo plan moves forward with its ambitious mission, like the Texas Cavaliers Education Center, the new visitor center and museum, what role do you play as the on-site archaeologist in preparing for that construction? My role is really to ensure that construction does not negatively impact 
any buried cultural resources. So a cultural resource can be something as simple as a foundation, or maybe it's a defensive trench that the defenders dug, um, or maybe it's just a bunch of bottles that were thrown out. My job is to make sure that that history is preserved in some way. We don't always leave the features in situ, meaning in preserved in place. We try to, sometimes construction um, has to move forward. So we find out, uh, we figure out ways to protect any type of, of resource. And sometimes those resources are removed from the ground, but preserved in other ways. So they might be pr processed in the lab or they're documented and um, they're written about in the report. So it's something that maybe it's been taken out of the ground, but it will not be forgotten. As we said at the start of this episode, October is Texas Archaeology Month. Super exciting for you. Yes. You have a number of hands-on activities planned around San Antonio. Yes. So on Saturday, October 14th, we're going to have an event here at the Alamo. It's going to be a very exciting day because it's also the um, the annular solar eclipse, I believe. It's is a that? big day at the Alamo. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. So you can come on down to the Alamo and participate in our activity, which is a mock excavation. We'll have a little unit set up, and it will be geared more towards um, the kids, but it's it's really fun. We we did a trial run of this over the summer, and it was received very warmly. So we'll have that. We're also going to have a, a table set up where we talk about methodologies and also soils and what exactly we look for when we're excavating. And then on the 21st, which is the following Saturday, we will be participating in International Archaeology Day. And this will be held at Mission San Jose. National Park Service puts on a wonderful archaeology day. So I, I really encourage folks to come out. The Alamo will be there. I will be there. And we will have um, different activity handouts for, uh, for folks and talking about, you know, the archaeology at the Alamo. And there will also be other tables, you know, other archaeology firms and I think a couple universities. So it's going to be a fun day. And I know NPS also will be giving free tours that day. Love it. And for those of you not able to travel to San Antonio, we are going to have some fun activities for kids posted on our social media pages throughout the month. Yes, we're going to have some coloring pages, word searches, and crossword puzzles. Okay, so you always say that you enjoy digging in the dirt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and a lot of kids feel the same way, but, you know, in their sandboxes, but may not know how to funnel that into the future. What's your advice for anyone considering a career in archaeology or parents listening who may see that, you know, in their kids right now? You know, I am... I get in conversations all the time with adults who say, I never knew this was a career or I was interested in archaeology as a kid, but I didn't know what to what to do with that. Um, so there, I think archaeology just in general, we do a poor job of advertising ourselves, but it is a viable career path and there's multiple uh, trajectories you can go within archaeology. And the best way to get involved and figure out what's best for you is to start attending events or meetings held by your local or state historical societies or archaeological societies. Texas Archaeological Society is fantastic, and they also um, provide field schools for um, people who are interested, and I believe those are yearly. So networking. It is, it is networking and figuring out what you want to do. And the only way you can figure that out is by talking to people who are in the field. And you do offer internships at the Alamo. I do. I just started this past summer. I've had um, so far three interns in archaeology. Those are posted on our volunteer and internship page on the website. I won't be able to offer internships every single semester, but whenever I have a lot of field work going on, I will be able to have someone come from uh, one of the college level uh, courses. You certainly have a unique perspective on the Alamo. How has being the on-site archaeologist given you a new appreciation for the history here? What never fails to amaze me is how much we still have to learn. Um, now, don't get me wrong. We know a lot, but there's always more to, to learn. And through our excavations and through the archaeological analysis, we continue to grow our knowledge base. And 
what's really exciting is having that physical evidence of what we've only previously read about. So it's really exciting. And I just love that I get to play a, a small role in a story that's, that's much bigger than me and, and much bigger than Texas. Dr. Tiffany Lindley, thank you so much for joining us. We have lots of links in the podcast notes for things we talked about today, like those Sanborn fire insurance maps, the Swiss coin found in a recent archaeological dig, and of course, information on all the cool events the Alamo is participating in for Texas Archaeology Month. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. Podcast.